In the previous video, we discussed dirty categories. To introduce this topic, we were discussing a feature that looked a little bit like this. We had some sort of a description of a profession. So we might have senior engineer, and maybe also something like junior engineer. And the argument that we made was that it doesn't make so much sense to model these as one-hot encoded features. Instead, it might be more sensible to consider this more like text where we look at all these trigrams, so to say, to construct a sparse array of features. By doing it this way, whenever we would calculate a similarity between two professions, we would be able to at least do something that kind of feels like a Levenstein distance, in the sense that if words overlap, that we are able to assign some sense of similarity. And you can argue that this is indeed very sensible. When two items are very similar as far as text is concerned, then their representation should also overlap. However, this approach does come with one downside. Namely, that we end up with a sparse array over here. Depending on the model that you're using, this could be fine. For example, if you're going to be using ridge regression, then the internal solver can totally deal with these sparse arrays. However, not every model can do that. In particular, the histogram gradient boosted models these models actually assume a dense representation. It can totally deal with missing values, but sparse features aren't supported. And that does pose us with an interesting conundrum. There are very good reasons to assume that a ensemble-based tree model like this one could perform better in a lot of use cases. So what do you do? Do you just use Ridge instead? Well, it turns out you don't have to. There are a couple of techniques inside of scikit-learn that allow you to turn something sparse like this into something that is indeed dense. However, when we do this, we should keep in the back of our mind that we don't just turn every item in a sparse array into its dense representation. Sparse data structures usually have lots of zeros that we don't actually want to store in memory because then the memory would just blow up. So instead of just bluntly taking the sparse representation and turning it dense, what we're gonna do is we're going to apply dimensionality reduction instead. In particular, we are going to have a look at PCA for this one. And what we'll see that's pretty interesting is that we're not just going to get a smaller dimensionality. We can actually use this as a general technique to turn something sparse into something dense while trying to not lose information while we are doing that. And it's a bit of a subtle thing, but this is actually a pretty legitimate use case for dimensionality reduction techniques. Sometimes you just want something that is dense without it exploding in memory. I am back in my Jupyter Notebook over here. And in particular, I have the pipeline from the previous episode. And we can also see that when we pass it our long list of employee position titles, that we can then get this count vectorizer to turn that into numeric features, but that this generates a sparse array with about 1500 columns, a bit less actually. In this particular case, this data set is actually not that big. On a larger data set, this sparse representation would definitely have more of an effect, but technically we could turn all of this into a simple dense array, and technically that would work. Nonetheless, what we're about to do is we're about to use PCA to see if we can reduce the dimensionality of this sparse array. And that is something that I'm doing over here. You can see that I've got my count vectorizer just like before. I'm calling fit transform on that dirty list, and I have my sparse array that goes out. Then, I have a principal component analysis estimator over here. I'm setting it to have 10 components, and I'm also telling it to use a specific solver. It is this solver that is going to allow us to learn on sparse arrays. So if you're going to repeat this exercise, make sure you pick this one. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it the sparse array, I'm going to transform it, and lo and behold, we can see that what comes out has way less dimensions to what we had before. PCA is doing its job. It's doing dimensionality reduction. At this point, a very good logical next question would be, well, how much do we actually like this reduction? It's definitely cool that we are using less memory in a dense representation, but when you're reducing it down from 1500 columns to 10, you're also bound to lose some information. So how might we measure that? There's a couple of ways to do this, but one technique that we can use is to reuse PCA to perform a inverse transform. The thinking here is that we have a very long array, so to say, and PCA is going to apply some sort of 
matrix transformation to turn that into a smaller array. The linear algebra trick that you can then do is you can say, well, let's take the inverse of that matrix to then see if we can maybe make it big again. If this transformation is a good one, then hopefully we don't lose too much information when we do this. And that allows us to say, well, let's look at the difference between the input and the output array over here. And if that difference is big, well, that's an indication that we are losing a lot of information. So just to retrace the steps, I'm using PCA here. I am transforming the sparse array going in. That means that what comes out over here is my dense representation. Then I'm going to use the same PCA model to take the inverse transform. That means that this is a recovered representation of the sparse array. I then subtract the sparse array from it, make sure that I'm only using absolute numbers, and then I take the sum, and this is a number that you can use to compare different PCA models. And in particular, one exercise that could be useful is to check different numbers of components to see how much effect that is going to have. So for that, I wrote this little script over here. I'm looping over all sorts of different size variables. The size variable is going to determine the number of components over here. I train my PCA, and then I reuse my cost definition over here, down below, which means that for every size number that I have, I also have this distance number, so to say, this difference. Then next what I can do is I can scroll down, and I can indeed have a look at how much information I win or lose when I choose a different number of components for PCA. One thing that we can see right off the bat is if we go from 1500 columns to about 1000, then we barely seem to lose uh, information. Or at least I really need to scroll quite a bit before I see any meaningful uh, deviation from zero. Same thing for 500. But then as we go to about 200, then we do see that we actually gain a fair amount of difference. And the smaller we go, we really see that the difference uh, starts to skyrocket over here. Charts like this can help you get a bit of an appreciation of information loss. But in general, if you're going to apply PCA like this, it really helps to have a downstream task. We have our sparse features, and then PCA turns them into dense features. And usually some sort of machine learning model afterwards can tell us something about the predictive performance. And nine times out of 10, that'll be the main thing that you're gonna go after. And that should probably also be the main thing that's going to determine the number of components that you use over here. However, I would like to make a small detour now to talk a little bit about this dense representation that comes out because there's also an interesting interpretation there. So let's now make a proper pipeline in scikit-learn where the first step is the count vectorizer and then the next step is a PCA. And let's also go for 50 components for now. The benefit of having a pipeline is that I'm not dealing with two separate components anymore. But either way, I now have a pipeline where text can just go in and then a dense array goes out. And that is something that we can actually visualize. What you see over here is a matplotlib chart where this is the text that goes into our pipeline and right next to it is the dense representation that the PCA eventually produces. When you look at this, there are a few things that kind of stand out that are a bit interesting. We're dealing with PCA here. So one thing that's actually kind of interesting is that the features that we have on the left side of this chart are just a little bit more pronounced than the features on the right over here. This is partially because of how PCA works. It really tries to find the principal components first that capture the most amount of variance. And then later down the line, it starts to maybe gray out a bit. Everything on the side over here definitely carries some information, but the most important information should be shown first in the array. So that makes a bit of sense. If you squint your eyes, you can also see something else that's moderately interesting. And that is that this set of features, this set of features, and this set of features seem a little bit similar. Low color, high color, low color is the pattern there. Notice that for those features, the term office or officer or officer down below here all appear. And that's kind of what we would expect. Because there is an overlapping term in these titles, I would also expect the vector output to be somewhat similar numerically. And we do see some evidence for that. And that I would argue is somewhat convenient. 
we see a similar pattern over here below. This row is also pretty similar to this one. And if I had to guess, it's probably because the word specialist occurs in both. Now what this implies is that we actually have found a vector representation that kind of encodes Levenstein distance in a way. And I should emphasize that I'm being a bit hand wavy here. It's not actual Levenstein distance, but it does seem that we are dealing with vectors over here that are able to capture the overlap of subtokens. And that on its own is pretty interesting. That said though, you could wonder if the representation that we have over here is the most interpretable. It's great that we went from something that is sparse to something that is dense, and it also deserves highlighting that the fact that we're able to do this with PCA is definitely nice. It's actually a fairly recent feature that we're able to do this in PCA in the first place. And again, while it's great that we're able to do this with PCA, maybe we can do something a bit more clever, such that the representation that we get over here is a slightly more interpretable and maybe also more useful for models. That is a topic for the next video though.